Well, um, two weeks ago, uh, we had Lord's Supper service, and uh, we preached more or less on um, uh, till He come, or to take the Lord's Supper till He come. And so the Lord's Supper is a looking back, it's a remembrance, it's an introspection, it's a personal commitment to the day, it's a look ar- looking around being committed to Christ and being committed to each other as we take the table together as a local church. Uh, but it also is a looking forward. We partake until He come. It's a statement of doctrine, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, but it's also a statement that He's alive and He's coming back when you partake of the Lord's Supper. And that happened to be on the high holy day of Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, or the start of that 48-hour period. And, and I'd never done that because we usually preach in September, but this time we were preaching in October, so we were able to preach that at the very time. And then last week, we talked about Yom Kippur, or the, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of uh, Atonement, and we talked about five arcs and how the Bible has this unique word, the ark, that all the translators in many languages have kept the word ark. It's a unique word, and there's a multiplicity of those, and it's a sacred vessel designed and built by God that's going to carry you someplace safe. And uh, we have uh, preached about the fifth ark, which of course is that millennial age city, the New Jerusalem. And so we got to talk about both those days. Well, interestingly enough, then, we've come to another day, the day of the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, so I thought we would just, for some of you who are new, just review what these particular feast days were. Now, remember when I brought up the three phone cords and I said that God is not subject to time, although He created time. We always want in prophecy, we want a timeline that we could mark events on, but God made time in cycles, right? The the evening and the morning, that's a cycle, we're the first day. A series of days become a Sabbath or a week. Uh, A series of weeks become a month. A series of months become a year. A series of years become a, a Shemitah or a set of seven years. Seven of those sevens become a Jubilee, et cetera, et cetera. And we looked at all the time frames all the way up until a millennia. And so God has a plan, and it includes time, and it works cyclically. And so while we try to put one little scratch of a line on a time and say, maybe God's coming here, maybe not, God's not coming here, the fact of the matter is multiple timelines are working at the same time. And when the Bible says, in the fullness of time, when all those things click at the same time, God has always done His plan. God's got a plan. And Christ has left, given us the Holy Spirit, but He said He's coming back. Listen, Jesus said He's coming back. So that is as much a reality as the deity of Jesus Christ. As much a reality as only the blood of Jesus Christ saves from sin. So Jesus Christ is alive, and He is coming back. He's got a plan. And this period of time that we've been living in is a... uh, It's all a period of grace. It's not just the timeline of grace, but it's a period for the church. But God will reinstate Israel. He already has done that in most of our lifetime. And He's brought that to the forefront. Israel is a cup of trembling to the whole world today. That's how we know, man, we're getting close. We're getting close. And, um, and so then prophecy becomes even clearer, right? It's not a vague thing. I hear some people say, when you start talking about it, well, it's just confusing. And you just kind of, anything confusing, you kind of just let it go, you know? But it's important. It's important as your eyes. It's kind of confusing, but I'm not going to let it go, right? I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to pursue it. And prophecy is important. It's not something that's confusing and you just dismiss it or let it go because it seems fearful. And one of the themes the last two weeks is really setting aside the fear of prophecy. The only thing that you have to fear if you're saved is being transfigured and into eternity forever. Now, if you're lost... There are some timelines that are going to change your, your capabilities of being saved. And so that is a fearful thing. And, uh, and so, uh, but that wrath to come is not for us. It's not for us. And so we're just looking for God's heavenly light. We're looking for heaven. We're looking for redemption. We're looking for a rapture, if you will. And so for us, that's good news. It's a continuation of good news. Today I want to look at then this last part of the fall feasts that God talks about. So if you look at Leviticus chapter 23, of course, this is the fine-tuning of the law. Chapters uh, 16 through 21 talk about the moral law. 
And then we get here and we have a codification of time. In other words, when God created these cycles of time that he tells us about in the book of Genesis, there was no law. There were no Jews, right, until after Abraham. And there was no law until Moses. But there was still these cycles of time that people saw, they experienced. They experienced seasons, right? They experienced planting and harvest. They, they experienced uh, days and weeks and months and years. They experienced these things. They recognized these divine cycles. You remember when we were talking about 2012 and the Mayan calendar and how incredibly on that it was. And they had other measurements there that, that um, you know, astronomical observation had given them over the millennia. And the fact of the matter is, even the pagans, even the lost man, could look at the cycles and measure the cycles and knew they were predictive and knew that they were connected to whatever God was and whatever he was doing on earth. And they recognized that. That's what the book of Romans says. It says you're without excuse because God, through creative power, through the creation, has made you without excuse because you can see his eternal power and glory simply through time and creation. And, uh, but when we got to Moses and the law, then all of a sudden now we're codifying what everybody knew was true. Now, I'm sure the devil was interfering with this cycle. The Bible says that the Antichrist is going to try to change times and seasons. Interesting article with uh, Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, and uh, from Atlantic Monthly. I don't have time for it, but I challenge you to read that this week from Atlantic Monthly called Jeff, Brezo Jeff Bezos' Brain, what he's thinking to do. And it's almost word-for-word -word biblical. He's seeking to change times and seasons. Wow, that's amazing. And uh, so we know that that's always been around. But here, um, Moses is giving it in the law. So let me read a few things, and when I leave a blank, I want you to read just one word, okay, that's there. So follow us in Leviticus chapter 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord. Notice, this does not say the feasts of the Jews. All right? So thou shalt not kill. We say, well, that's, that's a law of the Jews. Well, it was a law of the Jews before it was codified. It was, it was a law of God before it was codified. Cain did not have the liberty to kill his brother, right? These are called the feasts of the Lord, uh, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are, what? My feasts. Now, the word in the Hebrew here, feasts, is the word moedim, and it's plural, and it means appointments. In other words, there's other places in the Old Testament where this word moedim is found, and it's translated appointments. Okay, so the translators knew what they were doing, and in some places the word was translated appointments, and in some places it was translated feasts. God is saying, I have some divine appointments with you. Now, that gets my attention, amen? The stuff previous in Leviticus is a little bit scary, but it's instructive. But here, God is saying, I've got an appointment with you. How many of you have a little appointment book? Or you have some appointments set on your smartphone? And that thing goes off, hopefully. Reminds you to wake up and get where you need to, to go, right? And so appointments are important things. Notice that he says that ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. What is a convocation? Well, when we used to uh, have graduation, I was in public school, you were in public school, Brother Jay, uh, even though it was a public school, there would still be a public local church service for high school graduates, even in public schools. And they would call it convocation. And one of the local churches would open the doors and the kids would come and they would practice uh, kind of walking down the aisles and it would be a practice for graduation and it would be called convocation. And so the reason that these are laid out to be practiced every single year ad infinitum is because God is saying, I've got some appointments for you, and I want you to practice them in expectation every single year. This is important. And so these feasts are to be holy practice. Now, you would say, we're not Jews, we're not under the law, we don't need to practice these things, and that's right. We don't, practice, we don't have 
Rosh Hashanah service or Yom Kippur service. I mean, we're not Jews and we don't practice this per se for the law because what? Because great, the Lord Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the law. And we have the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled these appointments. Let's look at them. Verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their... It's interesting they use the word seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's what? Now, whenever we have Easter service, it's interesting that Jesus came and did what he did for us, and the backdrop was Passover. Now, beloved, that wasn't the backdrop. That was the fulfillment. That was all God's cycles of time coming together at the right time, and Jesus Christ was our Passover lamb. So God said, I have, a, I have an appointment with you, and Christ came in the fullness of time and kept the appointment to the day. And by the way, to the hour, hallelujah. Kept it. He kept it. And look at verse 6. On the 15th day of the same month is the feast of what? Unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. When we partake of the Passover at the table, we partake of unleavened bread, right? We're looking back to that thing that this looked back to. And that was the escape out of Egypt when they prepared unleavened bread. And we take, partake unleavened bread, but we say it is the body of Christ. So the things are connected, not just in remembrance and history, but they're connected also till he come in the forward looking of his fulfillment of his appointments. And that, that comes out in the Lord's Supper. Look at verse uh, 10. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof, ye shall bring a sheaf of the what? First fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So, Jesus came and in that short span of time was the Passover, was the unleavened bread, and was the first fruits of the resurrection. So these first three feasts happen in echelon, and the Jews would practice them always kind of looking back or maybe looking at the agricultural aspect of them. But remember we said God not only has a religious calendar and a civic calendar, he also has an agricultural calendar. And they all lay together. And so Christ was all these things. And so the spring, that's the season, feasts, God made an appointment. They were practiced and reminded all the time what these things would be. They looked back, but they were supposed to be looking forward. But what happened? They quit looking forward. They just looked back. They thought they were practicing the law, and they were keeping the appointments and keeping the feast like some religious rigmarole. And uh, don't worry about me falling off the steps. I know where they're at. <laughs> there. <laughs> that would be funny, too, if that happened. That did happen once before years ago. But, uh, um, and to the point where, that's right, that's right. To the point that um, God even said, I hate your solemn feasts. Now, he said they're my feasts, but he said to the Jews, I hate your solemn feasts. You're practicing them like you're, you're Jews and you don't care about the Gentiles, and you're practicing them like they're cold, dead idolatry, just like pagans keep high holy days. Amen? See, we're Christians. We don't keep the same high holy days that pagans keep. Beware of that, Christian. That's why we have a harvest party to offer you something fun and something different where you don't have to practice pagan high holidays, right? right? We could go on more about that, but we won't. <laughs> but we won't. I'm, I'm writing a Christmas cantata. It's a satire. It's a satire. <laughs> All right. Now, what else happened? Verse 15. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheave of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, ye shall number, what? That's Pentecost. And ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So I love it when Christians get together and they go, yep, Pentecost, that's the birthday of the church. Or Pentecost, that's the start. Or Pentecost, that's when the Holy Spirit came. Duh! Pentecost is not a gentile thing it's not a new testament thing it is an old testament thing it is something that was recognized before the law but that was codified in the law 
and that God said is one of my holy appointments when I'm going to be with you. And guess what? If you go to the book of Acts, it not only tells you the day it was, Pentecost, it tells you the hour that it was. Because they were saying, isn't it too early for these guys to be drunk, filled with the Holy Spirit? The Bible tells us the day and the hour that God was going to meet with us, hallelujah, with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that something? So God is not into, there are things that are mysterious, but all those mysteries are to be un unveiled. They're mysteries so as to keep certain, certain things, a.k.a. the devils, at bay. They didn't understand these things altogether. That's why men didn't understand them altogether. But these were God's feasts and God's appointments. So the spring feast and the summer feast, which was connected to the spring feast by this 50-day mark, have been fulfilled to the day and to the hour. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that amazing? Well, there's three more feasts. These ones come in the fall. Verse 23, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial blowing of what? Trumpets and holy convocation. Now the four times the New Testament mentions the rapture, it mentions that with trumpets. And what are we looking for? Are we looking for now a Passover? Are we looking for a Pentecost? Or are we looking for trumpets? Right. That's what we're looking for. And so God fulfilled these to the day and to the hour. And they say, well, the Bible says no man, no man knoweth the day or the hour. The construct there is no man now knoweth the day or the hour. But when the Holy Spirit come, you're going to know everything. The Holy Spirit is going to show you. Now, when did the Holy Spirit come? <laughs> On Pentecost. What did Pentecost teach us? God is keeping his appointments to the day and to the hour. Nobody really realized that until Pentecost. Until the Holy Spirit, moving in, enlightened people to see the Scriptures and understood them. Right? No man can understand the Scriptures without the Holy Spirit. So all of a sudden, this was understood. That God was keeping his appointments. And we have this uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Jews will call it, the head of the year which is the civic year, which is the day of the king. Look at verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying also, on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of a, what? Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer up offering made by fire unto the Lord. And of course, in antiquity, what did the Jews do in the tabernacle and in the temple? This was the day that the high priest wore the high priestly garments. He was a Masonic-like figure. Mess messianic, not Masonic, excuse me. And... Uh, and, uh, and he went in and he put blood on the Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies. So those of you that had never been to Sunday school and you don't know what that is, you need to check that out. Amen? Inside the Ark was uh, uh, Aaron's rod that budded and was a picture of failure of leadership, just as Aaron failed to lead and the people failed to follow. The manna, which God provided, but the people failed to understand God's providence, right? And they wanted something different, wanted something more. And then there was the Ten Commandments, which, of course, was the law, which the people immediately uh, began to break. So you have all this failure and all this condemnation and all this sin, all this goodness of God that reflects upon us, but it's covered by the mercy seat, and it's sprinkled under the blood. Amen? And so what a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he is and He was all those things uh, for us. That happened on the Day of Atonement. So we've preached about that the last two weeks. Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets always happens on the first of the month, which in God's cycle is always the new moon, which is a non-moon. Darkest day of every month is what? The new moon. The moon is gone. It's not there. It's a dark sky. Usually the stars are brilliant on that particular day. All these feasts happen on quarter moons, full moons, etc. But Rosh Hashanah happens on a moon where people are waiting to mark the beginning of time or mark the beginning of a month, or in this case, mark the beginning of a civic year, the king's year. They're waiting for the witness of that sliver of the new moon. And so no man knows the day or the hour except two witnesses proclaim it. And so not only was the Lord telling us it was a mystery, but he was giving us the key inside the mystery. And now that we have the Holy Spirit, we recognize 
that God has set up these cycles of time. He set up these appointments to work with man, and he's fulfilled them to the day and to the hour. But let's look at tonight the last one of the feasts. Verse 33, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the what? Feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. And uh, so it's a seven-day long concept. Now you can read again in Numbers, in the book of Numbers, the exact instructions for the Feast of Tabernacles. Now the children of Israel, they were traveling in the desert. God was in a tabernacle, the holy place. They called it the tabernacle, the holy place, the holy of holies. There was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And they followed around him and they set up their camp as oft as God would park, and they would, they would set up their camp according to the tribes. And the face of their tent would be open towards the light. Everybody was centered around the presence of the Lord. And so they already knew about marching and camping for 40 years. I mean, this was a nomad culture there for the time being, as they escaped out of Egypt and were going into the Promised Land. They could have done it in less, but they weren't obedient so they had to march around for 40 years until the next generation that God was worthily going to let in, not under Moses, but under Joshua. So you know the story there. But in all this, they were given the law. And Leviticus said, here's the time frame, here's the seven days. I think they already knew what that was. But they were also to set out these special temporary tabernacles. In other words... From the time they were living in Egypt to they were going to the promised land, this was a temporary period of time, these 40 years. They were supposed to go into permanence in the promised land, but these were, it, was a, it was a parenthesis of their existence. But inside of these parentheses is another small parenthesis, and so you're tabernacling while you're tabernacling. <laughs> Amen? It's a temporary, even more temporary measure. It's like if you went out uh, with your camper and you drove out and you were going to go camping for two weeks, but for a short period of time, you were going to live under a tent out of that camper. Does that make sense? Everybody following me? Okay. So what they were to do, Numbers explains, is they were to set up a square tent. Remember last week we talked about the square city? Remember that? So it was a picture of what they're supposed to be looking for. And they were to abide in this open-air tabernacle... Because on the top, they were to take certain kinds of vegetation and they were to lay it up on the tabernacle, almost like a grid. And they were to lay different pieces of vegetation on this grid. And of course, God has an agricultural timeline that was going to line up with his astronomical timeline. Because when we look at days and weeks and months and years, that all has to do with planets and heavenly bodies, right? I mean, God's pretty good with all that. So I'm not exactly sure what they were looking for. I have some ideas about astronomically what they were looking for. But what they were supposed to be looking for is they were looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Amen. That's what they were supposed to be looking for. They're looking for God and redemption. They knew that he dwelt in the sky in a cloud. What is a cloud? Cloud is a mix of atmosphere. We don't walk around in a cloud, we walk around in air and we breathe that. And way up above, there is no air, there is just space and you can't breathe that and in between is clouds. It's a, it's a mix of atmosphere. We know that, let's let this represent heaven over here. All these good looking teen boys, okay? Let this represent heaven. There's no darkness. Golden, amethyst, wonderful light. In it is no darkness at all, hallelujah. Do you believe in that? Is that a real place? Yeah. And then over here, let's let this represent where all the Lebec boys are hiding from their dad preaching. Let's let this represent earth. All right? This is where we are. And the Bible tells us there's, a, there's another place, an in-between place, called the cloud. It's interesting how technology likes to use that term, the cloud. They don't really have a real cloud. Why don't they just call it digital space? Why do they call it the cloud? because they're working on ethereal things. But there's a cloud. 
The Bible says when the rapture comes, and when, that, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, it's in a two-part return, isn't it? First, he comes and we meet him in the clouds. That's the rapture. And, and then second, he comes and he stands on the earth. But there's this mix of atmosphere. And uh, this time of tabernacles was waiting for the sky to open. We call it the Milky Way, but they didn't call it the Milky Way. I, I, I mean, it doesn't really look like milk to me. I don't see any cows up there. I mean, that's a modern term, but I, I imagine you could look out, up at it and you could call it the cloudy way as well, huh? Can I get an amen? So, so they knew that the sky was going to open up and God was going to do what God was going to do one day. And he wanted people to practice that in convocation year after year after year because God said, I'm coming. I've got appointments. They never expected to come first time through the womb of a virgin. They expected the sky to open up. But beloved, I want you to know that the sky is going to open up and he's going to come and the whole world is going to see him. And for some it will be terror, but for others it will be joy. You see, if, it is a, if it's a fire of wrath that comes down and you're not made of fire, then you're going to burn up. But our God's an all-consuming fire, and that's what's in me. Remember the cloven tongues of fire came in there? And so I can't be burned up by that. I'm not afraid of that wrath of God. That same thing that is the wrath of God is also the substance of God, which is the love of God. And when we're transcended, we're transcended into that. We're saved. Remember the Hebrew boys in the furnace? They said, if we burn, we burn. They threw them in there. And what was in there? Jesus was in there. And as long as they were in there with Jesus, the fire couldn't touch them. So this is what the, the people of God were to understand. They were to go a tabernacling. Now, that's not a King James Bible word. That's just a Doug Levesque demented word. But they were to go a tabernacling. Now, I've shown you the feasts of the Lord, and we're here at the Feast of Booths. Elsewhere, it's called the Feast of Booths because they were to make this outdoor booth. And the idea was you were to take your family out, and for seven days, there was to be a period of holiness and a period of expectation as you looked up the grid and you saw the stars. And, and every year, the grid would look the same because that time of year, the stars would be the same. And you would have these vegetations and realize that we're on earth, but, but God's got his time frame and God's going to keep his appointments with us. And God is surely coming and we're waiting for a rift in the sky and we're not afraid of our God. Amen. We love our God and we're waiting for this. And you were supposed to train your family in that. Now, I don't know why that is so absent amongst Christians today. Because we think it's a thing of the law, but it's not a thing of the law. It's a thing of God's time frame. In the beginning, he made it so. He started off. There's evening and the morning were the first day. He started the cycles. Teach us to number our days, the Bible says. And then the Bible says there's going to be an end. We know all about Daniel's 70th week. And we know about seven years and three and a half years and, and 1,260 days and 1,260 days and, and uh, three and a half years and 42 months and we know about that timeline, and we want to put lines on the timeline and say, this is how it's all going to look. And I don't have any problem with that, except for the fact I want you to know that God's got a day and God's got a time. And He's coming. And the Bible says we're to look for it. Some people say we're never to conjecture about these things. Amen? The Bible says we're to love it. We're to love His appearing. This morning, Pastor preached that, that, that message, and he read that verse. A crown of life to those that love is appearing. Some Christians, they love the fact that they're redeemed. They love the fact that they're saved from their past. They love the fact that they're not going to hell. But they're not at all about looking for heaven. You want to get some more land? You want some more vacation time? You want another timeshare? You want another great big vehicle? You want some new shoes? You want some more stuff? You want another fun time? We're living for today when we should be living for heaven. And that's what these feasts were about, to keep everybody looking forward, but to, to expect that time. So turn, turn next to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. This is the faith chapter. Hebrews, New Testament, chapter 11, verse 8, by faith Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. Now, we know he's talking about Canaan land. We know he's talking about the promised land. But ethereally, spiritually, this is talking about a place that is an inheritance. 
You and I have a place of inheritance, and it's not really the earth. You don't have a place, and it's inheritance, and it's a heavenly city. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I come back, you're going to inherit that place. And that's really what Abraham, before the law, understood by walking with God. Amen? So it's always been the same. You could be like Abraham and Sarah. Walk with God and look forward toward your inheritance. Hallelujah. And he went out not knowing whether he went. There was a mystery to it. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in what? That's interesting. With Isaac and Jacob, the heirs, with him of the same promise. Read verse 10 with me. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God, not a human city. Remember Babel? That was going to be a human city where we were going to reach God. And then came Babylon. Babylon was a city four square with a river running through it. What were they trying to do? It was a satanic imitation of the real thing. It was people trying to be God on earth and bring heaven down to earth and bring it into their own subjection. That's satanic. That's been tried to repeat it all through time. You can look at the Orient. You can look at the West. You can look at kings and emperors. They always build a square city. They always put a river through it. They always have this idea that the king, he is God. It's been repeated even today. Washington, D.C., if you look at it, it's a square city with a river running through it, with ethereal effects in it. You say, yeah, but we have a president. Yeah, but we have a president who thinks he's God. Past couple have thought they're God. The Antichrist quotient is high. Not just in the men, but in the, in the people being blind to what they're really living for and what's really coming and what we should be rejoicing over. We should not be rejoicing over left or right or Democrats or Republicans. We should be rejoicing over we have an inheritance. We have the real thing, amen. We don't need a utopian earth. That's what Bezos is trying to build. He's not just a capitalist. He's a psycho science fiction freakazoid. You know what Amazon was called before it was Amazon? He loved Jean-Luc Picard of Star Trek, and Jean-Luc Picard would always say, make it so. That was always his command, make it so, which is kind of cool. And he was a Frenchman, so I like him. <laughs> but that's what Amazon was going to be called, make it so. Yeah, <coughs> scary, amen? So Abraham tabernacled. He went to tabernacling. Well, but that's what you and I are doing. We're tabernacling every day. We're abiding. We're dwelling with the Lord Jesus Christ in these tabernacles that have him in it. And we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. That's what we're supposed to do. We're to see it. We're to see it. And we're persuaded of them and embrace them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Listen, you are a stranger and a pilgrim on earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. I'm glad to be an American, but I'm glad to be a citizen of heaven. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Whew. Sorry for be being excited, but not really. Look at chapter 12, verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they had heard and treated, that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. In other words, we're not talking about the earthly Mount Sinai. We're not talking about that appointment. Look at verse 22. But ye are come unto the Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God. The what? Heavenly Jerusalem. There really is a heavenly Jerusalem. Zion, the city of God. And to an innumerable company of angels. That's what I'm going to preach about next week. The company of angels. 
and our relationship to them. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God and judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For they escape, if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn from him that speaketh from heaven. Beloved, you can reject what I'm saying, but you're a fool for rejecting it. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. You know what the preacher was preaching about this morning? Get it right, man. Get it right. It'll make you worship right because you see it right. For our God is a consuming fire. Chapter 13, verse 10. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle or the earthly tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin and burned without the camp, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach, for we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. That's what tabernacle is all about. That's what the next seven days are all about for the Jews. They'll go outside and live outside and do that, but they'll do it wrongly. They'll go outside and they'll, they'll be practicing a cold, dead religion. It'll be a form of idolatry as they practice it. But, beloved, we can recognize that from time immemorial, right, before the law, through the law, and now in this wonderful age of the church, that God's got appointments that he's going to keep. And we know what we're looking for. Wow. All right. Last thing then, Revelation chapter 21. Can somebody tell me what time it is? 57. 57. Got a few minutes left. Is that what you're telling me, Pastor Jay? I'm not one to speak. <laughs> I am, I'm not either. We are, we are failures in that regard. I have an aspiration every Sunday. <laughs> I'm amen, but... This, this is, hey, listen, this is your pulpit, and I'm on your time, so you said I had a few minutes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it, Peggy. Uh, Revelation chapter 21. So we've seen the Old Testament, and we've seen the New Testament. It's teaching the same thing. It's a reality. There's an earth that we're living on, and there's a heaven that we're not at yet, and there's a cloud in between. And Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. I'm going to read about it in just a second. Stay with me. This is for real, man. And that place is going to come into that cloud. And when that happens, the angels are going to shout and trumpets are going to blow because that's a timing that the angels understand. All those cycles are going to be met. When that happens, you and I who are saved... The Bible says we're going to be translated from mortality to immortality. Amen. We're going to be transfigured. And we are going to be caught up, changed. And we're going to enter into that cloud. The Bible says into a place of temple where he is and where we are. In fact, this city is called the bride. You say, well, is that Baptist brideism? No, that's not at all Baptist brideism. So don't ever say that because Baptist brideism means us and nobody else. <laughs> Amen. We're not that, not at all. But we will be there with him for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Glory, hallelujah. It's going to be the finest hotel with the finest of people. It's going to be the grandest time. There's going to be so much love. The Bible says pleasures forevermore. Man, I can't wait for that. I've, been a, I've, married, I've married a whole bunch of couples off. I, I bet I've married 100 couples off through the time. And I'll be honest with you, it's my least favorite thing as a pastor <laughs> because of the bridezillas and their mothers. But um, I can say that now because 
I'm not the pastor. <laughs> I love on Sunday night when Pastor Jay is stuck with all the hours of cancel, can, uh, counseling and problematic things. I just go. <laughs> <laughs> and he looks at me too and goes. <laughs> but he's doing a grand job. I love him very much. Revelation chapter 21 now. Listen. Okay. You've got the picture, don't you? This is prophecy. This is real right now. And this place is going to move into this place, and we are going to be transitioned into this place, and that's going to begin Daniel's 70th week, what we call the final Shemitah, the final seven-year cycle. It's the tribulation. It's where the Antichrist, the Holy Spirit leaves, and men get to do what they want to each other. You realize we're the thing that holds back men from doing what they want to each other? It's the church. It's the Holy Spirit in, in us. They hate us, but we keep, we keep standing on the steps at the Capitol and telling them what they can't do. Amen. And there's a conscience there. And what's going to happen? Nation's going to rise against nation more than it is today. It'll be all unleashed. The Antichrist will come and just deceive, and people will take a mark. And they'll take it as a point of salvation. The Bible says it will be worship. But at the end of that period of time, the Bible says that you and I then are going to come with Jesus back to earth. Now, I think that this city is going to be seen. It's not going to be here yet, but it's going to be seen. Now, that sounds sci-fi, but forget sci-fi. This is real. I think people are going to see, oh, 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 God's here now. It's the end of the seven years. We're, we're past, past the seal judgments. We're past the trumpet judgments. By the way, those trumpet judgments fit with annual cycle, don't they? We just read it. And then there'll be the what? The vile judgments, the angels that pour the vials out. They, they're coming out of this ethereal cloud. And Jesus is coming. The Bible says we're coming with him. Do you realize that? That's why there has to be a rapture, because we're already here. We're already brided. We've already been made priests and kings to rule and reign with him rule and reign from this place over this place for a thousand years, the millennial reign. Is it come, becoming clear to you? And so then we're going to come and do that, and then the second coming is going to basically take place, and then Jesus is going to be king over the earth. That's why we pray, thy kingdom come. Because it will be, as Matthew says, the kingdom of heaven come to earth for a thousand years. But even that's not the end yet, because we've got to come to the end of the thousand years. And then there will be final judgment, what we call the great white throne judgment. And then heaven, will this, this wave, this uh, cloud will be like a wave that basically overcomes all of time and space and matter, what we call earth. And there will be a new heavens and a new earth, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's what the Bible talks about from everlasting to everlasting. Now, you might think I'm crazy, but I believe this. That's why I live the way I live. That's why I say what I say. That's why worship, like pastor says. Now, I'm going to read this to you, and we're going to get Pentecostal in here. And if you've never been there, just whew, take a breath. I was Pentecostal before I was Baptist. Did you guys know that? Okay, here we go. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Amen. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You guys lose your breath when your bride walked down the aisle? And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. That's what this high holiday feast of the Lord is about. The tabernacle of God is with men. The tent tabernacle and the temple tabernacle was just temporary. You and I are now a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. But there is a final tabernacle, what, what I called the fifth ark, that is prepared, designed, made by God as a vessel to take us out of time into eternity. Hallelujah. And it's real. Jesus talked about it. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and he shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Woo. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. 
and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, neither crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all law, law, uh, lawyers, <laughs> all liars. <laughs> yeah, all the Democrats and by the way, all the Republicans too. <laughs> shall have their part in the lake which burn with the fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, that's why some people say, well, this is at the end of the millennia, but here's one of the angels. And he says, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And he had a wall, great and high, and had 12 great, uh, uh, gates, and the gates 12 angels, and at the gates 12 angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Remember, that's what Abraham was looking for. And in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city lieth four square. And the length is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof and 144 cubits according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. And the building of the wall was, uh, 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 of it was of jasper and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh adjacent, the twelfth an amethyst, and I said that as best as I possibly could. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every single gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. They are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. So get this. This is why I believe the millennial age has this thing maybe half in, half out, but it's, the, it's, it's here touching. Now, it's 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles tall, 1,500 miles across. It would fit inside the moon. But here it is. And even in the millennial age, there's not a, a one world order. There's nations. And the kings of the nations bring their obeisance to it. This is real. What verse am I at? Thank you. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. God believes in immigration rules and borders. But if you're in the Lamb's book of life, beloved, you better get in the Lamb's book of life. Get your name in the Lamb's book of life. Amen? So how do I do that? You just say, I'm a sinner, Lord, I can't get in there by myself, but you died on the cross, you shed your blood, and Father, you're the only way I'm going to get my name in that book. And so, Lord, I bend the knees of my will, I raise the hands of my heart and surrender, and I say, save me, God, save me. I believe in Christ on the cross. He's, he's my only Savior, and it's the only way. And guess what? Name's in the book of life. Whew. And he showed me a pure river of Water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of it, of the street of it, and on the either side of the river was, three, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were the healing of the nations. That's why I believe that this thing is, is visible and part of the millennial reign, because it's actually ministering to the nations, and they can be Bible nations. 
Hallelujah. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Don't take the mark, take his name. Emmanuel. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. He saith unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the thing which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Verse 8, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to what? I guess so. What's your problem? You're not seeing God. You're not seeing what he's done for you. You're not seeing what he's got for you. You're not seeing the inheritance he has for you. You're focused on the house that you don't have. You're focused on the car that you don't have. You're focused on the body that you don't have. Worship him. Now that passage ought to make you fall down and worship like John fell down and worship. And get this, I like this. And I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. Are you supposed to worship angels? No. Which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, the angel, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, the prophets. This could be Daniel, I don't know but I want you to know it's a man. And of them which keep the sayings of this book. And then what does he say? Here's the, here's the message of one like you and I who's already there, who's already experiencing all that. Here is their message to us. If heaven could speak to us, if grandma and grandpa could speak to us, yeah. here's what they would say. Worship God. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Let me tell you what that means in the vernacular. You better read your Bible every day. This is the voice of God talking to you. You better be in church. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You better treat each other right. Amen. You better as often as you can get on your knees and get it right. Every Sunday, every day, however, however much wrong you got to get right. God is merciful. Amen. You're faithful and just to confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive your sins. That's for you, Jeremiah. You can't hide from me, son. can't hide from me, son. I'm going to finish this real quick, but get this. What do we do with it? Are we going to be on the cloud as little babies, wearing little pampers, little wings and little harps, and like just being bored out of our mind for all eternity? No, no, no. We, we've, got these, we've got this city that's going to blow away the Enterprise, and the Death Star, and whatever else you could possibly imagine. It's going to be an incredible city. It's going to be a smart city. It's going to be a living city with God. There'll be no criminals there. You'll all of a sudden have great character. Amen? You'll have a glorified body that's going to live forever, doesn't need to eat, but there's going to be fruit coming off that tree 12 different times just for pure pleasure. You ever eat one of them plums, that peaches, and it just it's everywhere when you're done? And you're like, that, I'm, I think I'll have another. You want to be hungry, but that'll be there. I've been up on a mountaintop with spring water coming out of a mountaintop. Can you believe that? And I put my face in it and thought, this water is sweet. How can water be sweet? But beloved, that, that water that we're going to drink of is, is going to be better than any fountain at, every, at any fast food place where you can kind of pick your own and mix them and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that water is going to be everything we always wanted and more. You, you will eat and drink to your heart's content there. And here's the greatest thing. This man, which helped share the revelation with John, was a man like you and me. Which means what? You and I, we're going to have a duty. We're going to have a mission. We're going to have a job. We're going to have an identity. We're going to have something to do for God, yeah. for each other, for all of eternity. Amen. Now, I don't think we're, even though we're going to be with God, we're going to be with Jesus, I don't think we're, ever, we're never going to be God or Jesus. 
And so I think we're going to forever be learning. I mean, it's one eternal day. There's no, there's no measure of time there. But I think we're constantly, God's going to have an eternity for us that is the greatest vacation ever. Dad, are we there yet? Where are we going? What are we going to do? Man, it's just going to blow. We're going to say, Lord, this is too much. We need a, we need a Sabbath in heaven because you're, you're entertaining us too much, Lord. Isn't that awesome? Let me finish. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of the book, for the time is at hand. You see, for the Lord, a thousand years is a day, a day is a thousand years. The, the Lord has spent more time in the grave than from his perspective here and his cycles of time than he, than he has in coming again. Let me say that again. The Lord spent more time in the grave according to his perspective of time and his control of it, than he has in waiting to come again. Now, you and I need him to come again. We need him to come again. We, we don't want to get to another election. Amen? The, the, the choices are getting crazier. We, we, don't, we need him to come again. But I, do I, can I tell you something? He wants to come more than you want him to come. This is, what, this is why he created time. This is why he's availed himself. When God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were in an everlasting past, they needed nothing. They decided that they wanted a bride. It was a love story. And this is the coming, of, this is the end of the love story. Amen? This is when, this is when the, the two bodies embrace to kiss and the camera goes upward with the fancy music. And can I tell you something? It's his story. And he wants it more than we do. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. If this doesn't move you, move you nothing will. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end, the first and the last. There's a heaven. There's an earth. There's a cloud. There's a Jesus preparing a place for us. Heavenly Jerusalem, a city whose builder and maker is God. And that place is about to enter into this cloud and the trumpets are about to blow and the angels are about to shout and you and I are about to earth leave this terrestrial ball. We're about to be translated into the greatest marriage supper. And that's going to go just, it'll be, seven, it'll be seven years on earth, but you know what it'll be for us? And then we'll be robed in white coming to rule and reign over this terrestrial ball with him. Now what will be, be great is this. We'll already be, have our glorified body. We'll have already experienced resurrection power. And we'll have the mindset of that. And we'll be down here loving these people and trying to make sure that they understand redemption. And yet we'll still have access to this wonderful place. That blows me away. That blows me away. God has made some appointments. And He intends... To keep them. And that'll make you worship. And all God's people said?